All right. Can everyone hear me? Am I, am I audible? Yes. Okay, good. Good, I'm glad. Hello, all. So, okay, first of all, I mean, you all know me, but let's take a breath. So here we are. It's, it's TEDx. This is a wonderful thing. You know, we've heard a lot of really interesting ideas, and I'm super, super glad. But ultimately, what I want to have with you is a conversation. You know, so let's take a moment to breathe and chat, right? So let's chat about men, one of my favorite topics. <laughs> Something of a subject area expert. So my name is Dalton Hall, and I'm going to be talking about performing masculine identity in an all-male school, right? Uh, and thank you also to Justin Baldoni, uh, who uh, I think prepared the ground very well for me with the TED Talk we watched, and whose Instagram page I have never visited for the workout videos he talked about. <laughs> but before we get into my discussion, we need, to, we need to make a very important distinction. So that's the distinction between sex and gender, because what I'm going to be talking about is gender, and the discourse on that has changed significantly uh, in the last few years. So I'm going to give you a definition from the World Health Organization about that difference, that sex refers to the biological and physiological characteristics that define men and women. Gender, however, refers to the socially constructed roles, behaviors, activities, and attributes that a given society considers appropriate for men and women. So Justin Baldoni talked a little bit about this, what it is that's expected of us, what it is that we do uh, to signal to other people that we fit into preordained roles or expectations for us. But it's not that way. It really isn't. Gender isn't something fixed. Judith Butler, in her seminal work, Gender Trouble, published in 1990, tells us that gender is not something that one is. It's not something that, that is fixed. It is something that one does. It is a conscious act. It's something that we do to reify what people expect of us. And I, I recognize that for some, that might be maybe a radical idea. Um, it's not necessarily something, it's something perfectly intuitive in that I think we all participate in it, but not necessarily in the way that we think about it every day. We kind of take thinking uh, binarily in terms of men, women, masculine, feminine, uh, for granted. They're things we think we understand. But really, at its core, gender is an unstable concept. Uh, it's something that uh, allows me to stand up here and speak with some authority because I'm wearing a blazer, uh, because uh, I have this stentorian voice. <laughs> you can all agree it's quite a voice. <laughs> my humor, something that I can use. These are things, these are luxuries that are afforded to me by virtue of the way I present myself. And that's not necessarily gendered, or maybe it is. We can talk about that. So Butler further qualifies her thinking. I recognize this is a lot of text. I'm an English major, it's what I'm comfortable with. <laughs> so we act as if that being of a man or a woman or that being uh, of a woman is actually an internal reality or something that is simply true about us. We take it for granted, uh, a fact about us, but it's actually a phenomenon that is being produced all the time and reproduced all the time. So to say gender is performative is to say that nobody really is a gender from the start. Now, that's an interesting idea. It's not necessarily intuitive, intuitive you know, but it makes a good deal of sense. So uh, how many people keep up with like red carpet and all that? Anyone? <laughs> Maybe the men in the room don't because they're told they shouldn't. <laughs> so red carpet fashion, something I enjoy. I'll never forget. So this was, I believe it might have been, um, I think it was the Tonys. Uh, Billy Porter shows up in a Christian Siriano outfit, and it was the most perfect garment I'd ever laid eyes on, because at the top, it was a tuxedo, and at the bottom, it was a ball gown. And if I could have walked into the Winter Ball in February in that outfit, <laughs> I absolutely would have done it. Now, what does a garment like that tell us about the ways in which we engage with gender? Gender is something mutable. We can transform ourselves, and that's remarkable. I, I certainly think it's remarkable. We need to talk about how we construct gender at Hampton Sydney College. And I'm going to hit you in the face with it because it's important. So I, the, earlier this morning when I was uh, starting and finishing my presentation, <laughs> <laughs> I am, after all, Dalton Hall. I have to uphold certain standards. I was running hither and yon to find this bumper sticker, which was given to me as a freshman, given to many of you, I assume. How many, how many students in this room got this bumper sticker? Yeah. 
almost literally almost every student in the room. This was given to me in my admissions package. Man up. So this is part of how we construe identity, masculine identity specifically, here in Hampton, Sydney. After all, I am talking about performing masculine identity in Hampton, Sydney. Man up. This phrase is charged. I have a history with it. I suspect every single one of you has a history with it. When I was eight years old, I heard this phrase for the first time. When my father was trying to make me mow the lawn and I was too weak and I couldn't push <laughs> the lawnmower up the hill. And it's just poor Dalton's scrawny tail. Uh, trying his damnedest to make this work, and his father bellowing in his ear, man up some and do it. I get this in my admissions package, and it's one of my first impressions of Hampton, Sydney. So think about what this means. And I don't even need to necessarily tell you. Search within yourselves as well. What does man up mean to you? It means many of the things that Justin Baldoni was saying. So we can't feel things. We aren't allowed to be weak. We aren't allowed to be vulnerable. God forbid we were vulnerable. We aren't allowed to engage with our male friends in certain ways, or in ways that would allow us not to be looked askance at. And so many, so many other things. I mean, there are, I, I could go on. Man up. So we're construing masculine identity in a specific way. We are telling our students first that they embody those values, presumably because they were told to do it the moment they were accepted to Hampton Sydney, but also that we're accepting certain kinds of students, students who conform to these values. Now, I had to run hither and yon to find this, because until very recently, this was very commonplace. I asked the woman at the school store, you know, can I buy one of the Man Up bumper stickers? And she told me in this very recondite way, yeah, we don't sell those anymore. And I'm like, I wonder why we don't. Maybe it's because we're becoming more conscious of the way we brand ourselves. Maybe, and this is my hope, it's because we're becoming more conscious of the way we think about masculinity on campus. Until. Hampton, Sydney, where men are men and women are guests. <laughs> now, there's a story here, too. I had, to I had to try to find this to scan it and put it in my presentation. I can't find anyone who has one because any person of good sense wouldn't touch anything that says something like this. You know where I found it. I worked over the summer on the papers of John Brinkley, who some of you knew. Uh, I ran to Shauna Hunter and I said, Mrs. Hunter, I really need one. Do you have like an outrage file where you keep these sorts of things? <laughs> Dr. Marholi told me to find you, Dr. Hardy, but you weren't in your office. She said, did you check the Brinkley boxes? And I said, no, that's a really good idea. I know just the box. Sure enough, that old misogynist had six of them. <laughs> I scanned it. I put it in my presentation. What else are we saying about how we construe masculinity here? Men are men. My goodness. It's Vladimir Putin riding a horse shirtless, <laughs> catching a salmon in their teeth. Isn't that a wonderful idea? It is for people like me who like watching those sorts of things, not necessarily for all of you. Women are guests. They're not how, female professors in the room, female administrators, you know, women who contribute substantially and meaningfully to the way we run things around here. Women are guests. We don't allow them or accord them permanence in this space. They have to leave it. And they can't be women, either. They have to be something else. That's not a good thing. Now, you'll never find this one anywhere, this bumper sticker. I, I'm, I'm glad that I could pull it out of mothballs for you. We don't, we don't talk about these things here. Or if we do, it's in a very circumspect way. And that needs to change. Because masculinity isn't simple. Like gender, masculinity isn't simple. So this is C.J. Pasco uh, exploring masculinities, theorizing masculinity as multiple rather than as a singular enactment, masculinities rather than masculinity. Uh, identity or social role emerged in an effort to capture historical and cultural variation and change. The multiple masculinities approach frames masculinity not as a unitary and stable category, role, disposition, or identity, but as a relational set of practices embedded in specific social structures and institutional arrangements, families, education, laws, religion, and more. Raymond Connell uh, would go on to later call this hegemonic masculinity, masculinity that exerts its presence uh, in clever, insidious, subtle ways through all of these different institutions. Masculinities, isn't that, that's an interesting idea. And it's very new. 
because there's no one way to be a man. So when we look at something like where men are men, unitary, singular, fixed, complete, men are one thing. They are men, whatever that means. They aren't vulnerable. They aren't free, artistic, interested. They're confined. And that, to touch on something that Dr. Iron said earlier, I think is anathema to education. It provides us a, a semblance of tranquility. Um, but the tranquility is earned only through essentializing. And that isn't right. So let me give you an example. Uh, just today, so I got up early to go to the wellness center. I needed to uh, speak with Dr. Corbett about my antidepressants. I got up early, and I was having a wonderful morning, because that's what adults do. They get up early. <laughs> and I could do all these wonderful things. I had breakfast for the first time in forever. I got to say hello to Mark Fierce, who rings the bell. You know, I was having a good morning. So I go down, and I get my breakfast, and I sit, and I have a quiet breakfast. And I, I say, you know, I'm in such a good mood, I'm going to spread this good mood. I'm going to grab an apple and bring it to a friend of mine. So I grab this apple, and I go to his place, which is just on the street from mine. I knock on the door, he doesn't answer. So I go in, because why wouldn't I? <laughs> My friend is asleep in bed, tucked up to the chin, tranquil as all being. I lay the apple on his desk, go on my merry way, and text him, hey, left an apple on your desk. He texts me later, and he says, thank you for the apple. Never do that again. <laughs> Should I have walked into a sleeping man's room? Maybe not. <laughs> what he wouldn't tell me, though, was why it bothered him. Because I asked. Because this is a friend in whom I have confided, and in, in, who has confided in me the darkest, most shameful secrets of our souls. You know, we have been very vulnerable in front of one another. But what is it about physical vulnerability? The fact that he was lying prone in bed that made him worry that, I don't know, somehow I was going to exert myself in some way. I don't know. Physical vulnerability, somehow, is what tipped him off. Even though we had been vulnerable in a real way, in a constant way, uh, in a very wonderful, freeing, liberating, fascinating, fabulous way, so many times before, he's trapped in this kind of thinking. But he won't admit it, uh, because why would he? If we admit problems exist, first we admit that something's broken. And then we take the responsibility on to say we're going to fix them. And that's a tough responsibility to bear it for some people. How do we fix the problem of a unitary masculinity at Hampton Sydney College? That's been the question I've been trying to answer for four years here, and I've got two weeks left, and I'm no closer to an answer <laughs> than I was when I first came in. But I have been able to observe fascinating, wonderful things over my four years. I've seen masculinity come into question, the idea of a singular masculinity, that is. I've seen something akin to an embrasure of masculinities, but not in any institutional way. I've seen it on the ground uh, among my set of students, the people that I, I hang around with, the people that I observe, people I enjoy observing, I suppose. And I'll give you another example before I, I move on to my next quotation. This was just uh, this past Saturday. Uh, I was one of a group of students that went to Lynchburg's Hill City Pride, which was wonderful. And, and students who were with me were able to express themselves in ways that they couldn't otherwise do on campus. They, they stepped into an alternate masculinity, a masculinity qualified by gayness. You know? So you heard the term gay shit thrown around in our pre-recorded TED talk. I hope we might be able to talk about gay shit because I love it. <laughs> but they were able to tap into a masculinity that was truer to them, and they could express themselves in a more meaningful way. And they expressed it physically. I mean, they were, they were looser, they were smiling more, and that's wonderful. But they can't do that here. That evening, we had an LGBT comedian come to campus, which was wonderful. I wish many more of you could have been there to enjoy it. Students who had come out to me but weren't out openly were there to experience a queer space, to experience a space where they could explore their masculinity as it existed alongside their homosexuality in a more meaningful, substantive way. And they took something out of it. It was amazing. They could laugh and be free. 
and engage with gay, like, gay ideas. Like, isn't that crazy? Like, gay ideas at Hampton Sydney? They could do this. And it meant something to them. And it meant something to me, too, because I've seen them come so far, and they can do this, but only in certain spaces. You know, and that's, that's a strange, strange thing to me. Because we're not quite there yet at Hampton Sydney. We can't quite admit that the Hampton Sydney man, an ideal to which I admit I've held myself for four years, is a unitary, monolithic, and fundamentally exclusionary ideal. Uh, it's one that values certain things over others such that that which is not is unwelcome. That's unacceptable. Raymond Kahn. To recognize more than one kind of masculinity is only a first step. We have to examine the relations between them, and that is what I have described. Students in different spaces with different people exploring themselves in different ways. This relationship, not only the relationship one has to one's own identity, but the ways in which that identity is expressed in the public sphere in a meaningful, substantive, real, authentic way. That's important. Because we're talking about identity. And if identity is performative, then it's something that's active. We consciously maintain identity. And we can choose to subvert it. Billy Porter does that with his fabulous combination tux and ball gown. I do that with my folding fan, which I did not bring with me out of respect for this hallowed institution. But I was willing to slip a few gay jokes in under the sauce. And all of you do that too, whether or not you're even aware of it. You are conscious of it, and yet unconscious. Here we are now, in this space. I've been talking at you. You've had these ideas thrown at you, and hopefully, I think, in a palatable way. Let's drop the act, at least among each other, right? Because now we're friends. I believe. I like all of you. I hope you like me, too. I have to be liked. It's compulsion. <laughs> Here we are. So let's do something with this space. And if we can't in the time we have left, because we don't have much time, I wonder if we might be able to take a little bit of this space with us to use it and shape it and spread it out such that our classrooms, dorm rooms, locker rooms become places where we can explore ourselves in meaningful ways. And to do that, I think, changes everything. It allows us to be more fully who we are. And that's fabulous. You know, I love who I am. I'm a pretty cool guy. Like you all think I'm cool too. You have to think I'm cool. It's a bullshit. <laughs> Wondering how much mileage I can get on that job. <laughs> I want you to have that same security. I want all of our students to have that same security. And they can. But they have to shirk off this ridiculous, confining, conception of masculinity as something they're expected to do here. They should be expected to do nothing more than exactly what they're comfortable with. If we can do that, our environment becomes richer. Our classrooms become even more fearless. Our locker rooms become places, perhaps, for sexual exploration. Imagine that. Our dorm rooms become places of conversation. And those conversations aren't even verbal. Interesting. Interesting. So I think. So I'll leave you with a quote from James Baldwin, and believe me, it's no mistake that the last words you're going to read are from a queer man of color. We, with love, shall force, I don't know if I like the verb, shall force our brothers to see themselves as they are, to cease fleeing from reality and begin to change it. Because, hello, this is the reality. Gender, as we understand it, is changing. Masculinities, as we understand them, are changing. They're becoming more inclusive. They're becoming welcoming spaces, spaces of exploration. We have an imperative as individuals, but also absolutely as an institution, to engage with these ideas critically, to see them in practice in our classrooms, dorm rooms, and elsewhere. And I hope that if I've left you with nothing else, I've left you with a few choice words from James Baldwin. Thank you.